Welcome to episode 10 of Advanced Sci-Fi Civilizations Too Stupid to Really Exist. A special double episode featuring our first race of stupid artificial intelligence is... Media Zealot stoops to a new low by attacking probably the softest target yet. And I'm sorry to say that this time it's totally personal. It's the Transformers from the G1 cartoon continuity. Aren't you glad to see us? I knew it. Take her, Monobots! Prepare to be amazed by these living, breathing, <sighs> sulking, giant alien robots. Marvel as they magically transform into a range of obsolete human technologies, such as a Polaroid camera, cassette tapes, and a couple of boomboxes lifted straight from an 80s ghetto. Tremble with fear at an evil villain so powerful his alternate form is a harmless inanimate object. A small gun that requires outside assistance just to fire it off. I hope your traitorous henchman is having a good day, because you have completely lost control over this situation. Sandwich, prepare to receive. I'm personally just thankful it forces Megatron to shut the hell up for a few minutes. Mine! Mine! Nothing can stand against me! Does that guy smoke two packs a day or what? <sighs> The Transformers come from a totally metal planet called Cybertron. Their society is innately dysfunctional in that it's starkly divided into two factions. The Autobots and the Decepticons. But we can't lay all the blame for this great dividing line in their society at the Transformers' feet. For they were created by the Quintessons, the original inhabitants of Cybertron and colossal dipshits in their own right. Unlikable, dry-skinned biped. They enslaved the Autobots to a life of labor and the Decepticons were used to fight their wars. But the Autobots overthrew their masters and actually managed to lock down a functioning Transformer society for a while before these Decepticon pricks rebelled against them, sick of their peace-loving bullshit. Spare me your pomposity! The Autobots and Decepticons then went through cycles of war and peacetime before this arsehole was created and led the most recent Decepticon uprising. And that's about the last time anyone ever did their job properly. Because these two factions have been in a perpetual state of war in the millions of years since, fighting for control of Cybertron and the planet's now depleted energy reserves. So of course, they eventually turn their focus towards Earth's piddly resources. Almost as if the story is designed to appeal to the eight-man children who reside there. Grimlock thinking dangerous enemy! Grimlock stomp enemies! After mucking around on Earth for two seasons, the Transformers animated movie and season three and four thereafter become an expansive space opera, subjecting us to a universe populated by a menagerie of other dumbass sci-fi civilizations. Idiot! But that's only after they killed off every character we ever loved because new toys. The Transformers canon exists as a multiverse of conflicting continuities. But even focusing on the G1 cartoon continuity alone doesn't do much to tidy up the mess. It only lessens the inconsistencies. I am not concerned with technicalities. For the Transformers cartoon is an inventive, imaginative, and entertaining sci-fi tale, which is severely compromised by Hasbro's unrelenting drive to shield toys onto mesmerized sproglets. <sighs> The television, it bewitched me. Killing off your main protagonist normally counts as a bold narrative move, but only when you don't stand to make millions out of doing so. I like to think of myself as a fully grown adult, but I didn't have the cognitive faculties to learn more than a third of the Transformers names before being bombarded by regular shotgun blasts of new toys. I mean characters. I've always considered your attention span to be adequate. That was before I realized I didn't really need to remember what's his face because characters randomly vanish from the show while other new ones appear without any explanation whatsoever. Things like character names don't matter in a story designed to meet the minimum requirements of immature attention spans. Me Grimlock no understand what you mean. 
That's probably why they felt comfortable using ethnic stereotypes. Socialist Democratic Federated Republic of Carbabia. And inserting weird moments of blatant sexual innuendo. Ouch! Sorry. Hmm. And that rear end assembly looks like it could use some old fashioned blowtorch work. This isn't the time for jokes, Spark Plug. This isn't the time for jokes, Spark Plug. Spark Plug. But hey, maybe this is payback because I too was violated by Hasbro's insidious shieldcraft. Then perhaps you can be nostalgic for both of us. Or maybe I'm justifying the fact I'm about to rip apart content intended for children. He's actually going to do it. But no matter how far I go, the Transformers irritatingly somehow retains an air of coolness that can't be completely snuffed out. Similarly, their civilization itself also seems immune to extinction, for the Transformers' entire existence is devoted to pursuits that consistently puts their race at great risk. Point 1. The Transformers' never-ending high-tech war should make their extinction inevitable. The predictability of their conflict leaves them vulnerable to outside manipulation. The Transformers were created an astonishing 11 million or so years ago and have been in a state of war for most of the time since. Oh, me Grimlock love long ago. Granted, 4 million years of that time had the main forces of both sides lying motionless on Earth, but the war was back on immediately after they came back online. You can be sure of that. But of course! Since the latest Decepticon uprising, this has been a war fought over control of Cybertron, energy supplies, and energy production facilities. The Autobots and Decepticons we know don't even have the excuse that they are carrying on their ancestors' war out of fear and ignorance. Because a lot of these individual Transformers have been alive since this conflict began. Both the Autobots and Decepticons probably fall into the category of super-powered beings who would get a mega bout of depression if they actually managed to defeat the other side. These are the most emotional robots you will ever meet. Never! Do you hear me? Never! If it isn't Starscream or Megatron throwing a tantrum, Immobilizer's mine! Mine! It's an Autobot packing a sad. Well, if he's not impressed, I'll be depressed. If the Transformers can find enough energy and they don't blow themselves to bits, they're essentially immortal. But obviously this gift is squandered in a pointless and never-ending conflict that consistently puts their civilization and Cybertron itself at risk. And the nature of this conflict often involves WMDs, timeline manipulation and other reality warping technologies. Crystalline structures echo watch like and packed with layers of multicolored rods. It's an extremely dangerous state of existence to tolerate. Both Megatron and Optimus had ample time to decide this shit ain't worth it and set up camps somewhere else to live in peace for eternity. <laughs> The situation becomes even more serious once you consider that the predictability of the Transformers conflict allows outside factions to manipulate this war for their own benefit. Firstly, the Decepticons and Autobots fall victim to several Earth-based conspiracies perpetuated by humans. Then there's Vector Sigma. I am Vector Sigma. Before Cybertron was, I was. An ancient artificial intelligence who despite having little in the way of a personality himself is capable of creating new personalities for the Transformers. Why have you done this thing? If anything, Vector Sigma should be all about the Autobots since it lived alongside them during the Transformers Golden Age. But it seems to do nothing but help the Decepticons. First by creating a bunch of new Decepticons based precisely on Megatron's orders. Fill them with hatred for the Autobots and all that the Autobots stand for. And then when the Autobots create their own new robots. And let them always value freedom and life wherever they find it. Vector Sigma gives a big up yours to Optimus by creating Autobots with Decepticon leaning tendencies. 
You talk about those Decepticons as if you admire them, Slingshot. They're well-built, resourceful, and they're superior to humans in just about every way. You know, I'm beginning to think those Decepticons had the right idea. Fast forward to the very end of the whole shebang. Vector Sigma directly intervenes in their conflict by giving the Decepticons the location of this key thing. It was Vector Sigma who arranged for Galvatron to learn of the key's existence. Because reasons. It makes no sense. Do not question Vector Sigma's motives. The excuse here is, Vector Sigma knew that the Decepticon plan would bring about a new golden age for Cybertron and the Autobots. But to do it, they had to bring Cybertron near Earth and almost destroy our sun, again. And Optimus is honestly okay with all of this? Why not? Once we go full space opera, the interested parties at play become a lot more powerful. We meet Unicron, a massive, vicious, planet-eating robot, who enlists and upgrades the Decepticons and in doing so puts the central focus of both factions on the one thing that can destroy him. You are to destroy the Autobot Matrix of Leadership. It is the one thing that can stand in my way. Yeah, did I mention these outside players are pretty stupid too? Just a Yeah, shit are dying, you know that. Season 3 sees the Transformers conflict essentially become a three-sided affair, with the Quintessons driven by revenge and their desire to reclaim Cybertron, introducing a conveyor belt of poorly devised but extremely powerful technologies to threaten the universe with. Slimy worm-fingered creep. The Quintessons seek to wipe out the Transformers. Destroy the Autobots. Come on, you gotta be kidding! Mostly they give the Decepticons the upper hand and then manipulate them into attacking the Autobots because apparently that needed doing. No mind. We just like to watch. These guys are so serious they blew up their new homeworld for the off chance it would destroy the Autobot matrix of leadership and then when they predictably fail they don't even seem to regret their thoughtless move. It cannot be true. They live. They live and come at an exorbitant goo number 8739. And here's Primacron, who can essentially mind control all primitive Transformers. He created a grand total of two planet destroying entities, which seem designed purely to wipe the universe clean. Thanks for that. Grimlock order Primacron to make everything like it was before. But let's not get too off track. Because no matter who is trying to manipulate them, the Transformers have no one to blame but themselves. It's only because of the general stupidity of individuals and the poor strategy of their leadership that the Transformers exist in a state that is easily taken advantage of. While the Autobots aren't blameless in this situation, it's the Decepticons that are the main instigators and supreme morons behind this ceaseless campaign of war. Point two, the Decepticon's incompetence, overconfidence, and lack of rational leadership stop them from ever defeating the Autobots. It's not like they could maintain a peacetime society anyway. Gaining energy is their daily grind, but conquering the universe, defeating the Autobots, and carrying on Megatron's ancient grudge are the Decepticons' overarching goals. Now there will be no power in the universe to resist me! Decepticon rule forever! <laughs> Straight off the bat, we can give the Decepticons a pass when it comes to their callous and irrational thirst for conflict. These guys were originally created by the Quintessons as their military units. Yes, there was a time when the Decepticons may have been capable of actually winning wars. But now, it's a different story because the Decepticons don't seem able to win anything but the occasional skirmish. And even then, it has to be a double episode or a feature length movie so the Autobots can get their own back. Transformers from both sides seem to have the magical power to change size at will. How is this achieved? But the Decepticons have massive advantages, like their innate flying ability, and they have the will to utilize a range of military murder machines and other powerful weaponry. Though the Decepticons' notable shortcomings and extremely poor leadership prevent them from ever getting close to the win. I do not! So let's take a look. 
One second! With a few exceptions, the rank and file of the Decepticon forces suffer from a distinct lack of intelligence and initiative. The majority of independent moves they do make are foolish or seeking to destabilize their own leadership. Now, repeat after me. We, the soldiers of the Astrotrain Empire, will obey Astrotrain and scavenge the energy for his empire. And generally, the bigger they are, the dumber they get. <laughs> this Trypticon behemoth is always starting shit with Metroplex near coastlines. But his main weakness seems to be open water. The dude can't even doggy paddle. I've got morons on my team! Not that smaller Decepticon units fare much better. The Decepticons are less interested in working as a team to secure the ultimate victory. More interested in berating each other, infighting, and furthering the pissing contest they have going on. You and Starscream look real geeky! It was his fault! You lie, Starscream! Silence, you fool! <laughs> This mistrust they have for each other can easily be taken advantage of. Mirage tricked the Decepticons into battling with the Insecticons just by shuffling around a few Energon cubes and getting them to fire in their direction. Talking things out is never the first option with the Decepticons. Most Decepticons are without honor or any sense of morality, even when it comes to their own. Swindle is so driven by pettiness, he sells out his Combaticon bros and resigns them to the junk pile. It's not my fault, Megatron. This greed is built into my personality component. Laserbeak, I can offer no criticism. He is an elite reconnaissance officer who rarely, if ever, fails a mission. And his weapons seem powerful enough to injure far more massive Autobots. He very well may be the Decepticon's greatest warrior. Welcome, Laserbeak. Unlike some of my other warriors, you never fail me. But as for the rest of them, despite being essentially military units, almost all of these grunts aren't equipped with a weapon capable of killing any robot in one shot. The Decepticons do actively seek to increase their destructive potential. So why no progress on their primary weapons? Most Transformers can be deactivated simply by snipping one wire just below the surface level. Killing these robots shouldn't be this hard. And as usual, it doesn't get better the higher we go up the ranks. In fact, in fact, it gets much worse. This guy is called Shockwave, one of Megatron's top dogs and admittedly one of the most level-headed Decepticons we ever meet. But unfortunately, he still suffers from the same lack of initiative as the rest of them. Four million years ago, Shockwave was charged with looking after Cybertron while Megatron went on a quick mission to Earth. But shit went down, and the main forces of the Decepticons ended up stuck on Earth doing sweet f all for millions of years. And what did this anointed captain of the Decepticons do? That's what I'd like to know. Absolutely nothing. He didn't go to Earth to find Megatron. He didn't use his time to restore Cybertron and solidify the remaining Decepticon forces. No, this faceless git sat there babysitting Cybertron for 4 million years, scraping by on whatever Energon was around, pining for Megatron to give him a buzz. But hey, at least he is able to transform into a weapon that he can fire all by himself. I don't like that. I don't like that at all! Though half the time, Shockwave seems to sit there motionless after getting himself off. Seemingly needing to smash into something to be able to transform back. So yeah, that's not exactly good. Now onto Soundwave, perhaps the most stoic of the Decepticons. I have to give him props for his rationalism and his tendency to help stay the blades of the more erratic Decepticon units. As the Decepticon's most skilled intelligence and communications officer, Soundwave is definitely one of the top dogs. But although he has shown a willingness to become leader several times, We shall rule! Soundwave superior, Constructicons inferior. His lack of action during times of leadership turmoil has shown him to be completely clueless when it comes to making decisions or providing direction for the Decepticons. Soundwave also doesn't have much in the way of fighting abilities, preferring to eject his tiny slave bots at the first sign of heat. But once they are overcome, he usually just stands there waiting to be bowled over. Explain this! And let's not forget his highly dubious exterior button controls. You've erased my tapes. Which allow Blaster to erase several of his tapes. Try 
Transmission terminated. Then there's Scourge, commander of his own little unit, but so inconsequential I'm not even sure why I'm bothering to mention him at all. Respect to his manicurist though. I must have it! Cyclonus, this guy is probably up there with Soundwave when it comes to not being a complete moron. And he perhaps does one better in that he on occasion does provide direction for the Decepticons, even when it pisses off the boss. I hate Cyclonus! Cyclonus occupies an awkward position where he knows Galvatron is too irrational to lead the Decepticons to victory. My bastion of brimstone rich. My kingdom of desolation! But then he himself doesn't have the balls to overthrow him. One could say that you were both the doubter and the doubted. At the end of the day, he is utterly devoted to Galvatron and never seizes leadership, even though he has ample opportunity. Cyclonus perhaps stands the best chance of leading the Decepticons into an era of stable leadership. I do not believe this! While Cyclonus, Soundwave, and Shockwave are utterly loyal to their respective commanders, Decepticon leaders are notoriously piss poor. So in these circumstances, such devotion should be considered a fault. Though that's not any sort of problem for our final Decepticon Lieutenant, Starscream. For all intents and purposes, this guy has been second in command for most of the Decepticons' existence. And he's a loud, obnoxious, useless, traitorous swine. I report your treachery to Megatron and I'll have you melted into welding rods! The first time we ever hear from Starscream, he's taking a dig at Megatron's leadership abilities. The Autobots would have lost eons ago if I'd been calling the shots. My time will come, Megatron. Never. Never! It's a trend that never lets up until Starscream's death in the Transformers the movie. Though even after death, he was still trying to overthrow the Decepticons leader. Although Starscream may indeed be right about his leader's shortcomings. That's about the only thing he's ever gotten right. Okay, Optimus, jump him now! Optimus Prime, where? And his quest to overthrow Megatron is a constant destabilizing force within the Decepticons. This guy massively overestimates his own leadership abilities. He never stood a hope in hell of leading a rebellion against Megatron, let alone managing the ruckus Decepticon ranks if he somehow succeeded. Brilliant deduction! Decepticons, fire! Starscream seems to get his shit together at one point, actually managing to carve out an empire all his own. I give the orders now, and this is my castle, as it will soon be. <laughs> but he only accomplished this by going back in time and wowing some primitive flesh creatures with the magic of gunpowder. He even gives the recipe directly to your toddler. Of course, it didn't take much to topple this little con. But perhaps his main sin here is that he didn't even attempt to see if this past exists in the prime timeline. Because then he could have snuck into the Autobot volcano and killed Megatron and most of the Autobots in their sleep. <laughs> Back in the future and again out of his depth, Starscream thinks he started an actual mutiny, but he's been betrayed by his Decepticon allies. I will get Megatron! Well, fooling him was easy. Who themselves aren't big fans of Megatron, but simply have utterly no respect for Starscream. <laughs> no planet ever lost its orbit, underestimating the stupidity of Starscream. Starscream then fails to take advantage of the leadership contest he caused, by fully backing Megatron at his greatest moment of weakness. Get this straight, I am Decepticon leader, you are recyclable. Well put Megatron. Not only that, he then admits to Devastator that he is a wimp. Yes, but I'm fast! This was probably the wisest single move Starscream ever makes. If he had ever been successful with his mutinous agenda, it's safe to say that Decepticons would be finished before episodes end. What? Because not only does Starscream have massive leadership inadequacies, he also delivers a constant stream of shitstorm inducing cock ups. Here's one Starscream's been saving for you. 
You fool! Starscream! Help save the Energon cubes! Get them out of here! Almost like he's a convenient device to destroy the Decepticon schemes at any time. Maybe during writer's strikes or whatever. So be it! Fire! Laughably, Starscream began his career as a scientist way back when. Starscream! <laughs> but nowadays, he seems to be highly irrational and willfully ignorant. Lightning Megatron! A bad omen! He is a massive hater on new technology, shooting anything he doesn't understand and regularly labeling all manner of powerful devices and weaponry as garbage. That idiotic contraption probably won't even work! Let's find out, Starscream! Transform! He also insists on operating untested technology at full power immediately. Tests! 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 Let's light this down! Don't you be talking smack about science around him though. Foolish human! Magic can never defeat science! Though Starscream definitely deserves a participation trophy for being one of the Decepticon's biggest liabilities. I've got a headache! They would never have had to endure him as long as they did if it wasn't for our first psycho head honcho, Megatron. You overconfident fool! Destroy him and his minions! He has the balls to make a call or two, but he's the saltiest, pettiest bad guy ever. If we can't have it, nobody can! And a progenitor of many a villain cliché. Game's not over, Prime! I'll be avenged! <laughs> I will teach you a Vulcan mind control technique that will help you inhibit your giggles. Megatron tolerates the threat of mutiny created by Starscream for literally millions of years, dealing out inadequate half measures, empty threats. You have had the only warning I intend to give. And a series of verbal and literal beatdowns. Personally, I need proof. Personally, I don't care what you need. Normally, some sort of meaningful coaching would be in order. But since we're talking about the Decepticons, what Starscream needs is a swift execution to end what should be an untenable situation. At times, Megatron does dole out some pretty sound advice to Starscream. You lack the ability to see your own faults. Unfortunately, he's also one of these hypocrite bosses who doesn't live by his own insights. We failed before through no fault of mine! Starscream runs a series of power-grabbing rogue missions, with the intention of using said power to overthrow Megatron. Megatron has usually got them all figured out, but he does nothing to dissuade Starscream from these activities. He mostly just swoops in at the end and takes the prize himself. You were just about to deliver the Nativator to me, correct? Uh, yes! Yes, of course! Megatron does eventually deactivate Starscream, only for him to reappear several episodes later without any explanation. <laughs> I never get involved in domestic squabbles. Finally, Megatron attempts to rid himself of Starscream for good. Not by killing him, of course, but by exiling him. And when that doesn't work, he just exiles him again, only this time further away. How original. It's possible Megatron tolerates Starscream simply because he needs the numbers. I have my reasons. Or maybe Megatron just couldn't do without his bro. Or it could be that Megatron relies on Starscream because Megatron's alternate form is a harmless Wolfer P-38 that requires a henchman or your child to fire. Eventually, Megatron understandably resorts to attacking Starscream even when he's behaving himself. I should have you disassembled for this! Me? But, but I... Silence! Hell, just kill him for his incompetence, whatever. It's obviously a total liability to have this guy acting as second in command. At least demote him or something. Power flows to the one who knows how. Desire alone is not enough. Time makes all things possible. I can wait. But Megatron's cultivation of this Sith-like relationship he has with Starscream isn't his only dysfunction. No one gets into my chamber! No, he also lacks severely in the strategy department. Megatron is all about short-term energy gains. More! More! Give 
me all your power! When we first see him, he holds a tenuous grasp over Cybertron. The Decepticons are basically living as scavengers, seemingly incapable of producing their own energy. He attacks the Autobots in an attempt to steal theirs, a trend which we can safely assume he's been following for a long time now. I haven't even started. So of course, with the Autobots gone, Megatron doesn't focus on restoring Cybertron and becoming energy self-sufficient. He instead follows his main supply of energy, the Autobots, to Earth. Megatron seems to believe that the key to dominating the universe lies in acquiring massive amounts of energy. We will return to Cybertron with enough energon cubes to dominate the universe. But finite energy won't help him much when he apparently struggles to manage even a single planet. He doesn't seem to understand the role that energy production plays in maintaining a society. Which isn't that surprising since he fails to grasp even basic energy production concepts. Tell Shockwave he will soon have enough energy to power Cybertron for eternity! And like so many villains with delusions of grandeur, he's utterly fixated on Earth. All flesh creatures shall feel energon cubes at once. Instead of seeking out the abundant energy sources of the cosmos, he's resigned himself to running the same old tired hustles he's always run. Only now, he's lowered himself to jacking oil tankers. I want all of your energy reserves. I want your coal, your oil, your gas, electricity, all of it. And then, only then, bring all the oil. Though at least the Decepticons attempt to indulge in practices that could end the war, one way or another. Their schemes to steal energy, restore Cybertron, and create super weapons are ambitious. But they are also innately harebrained at the same time. When the tidal wave hits the sea funnel, the fury of the ocean will turn the generators and fill thousands of energon cubes. I'll blow that asteroid out of the sky and sit back while the beast throws this planet into utter chaos. The furious powers unleashed by Cybertron's proximity to Earth will soon provide all the energon cubes we need. Once we have blasted the Earth's moon out of orbit, we will be able to control the tides with Soundwave's new device. Then we will flood the canyon, creating a nearly limitless power. Destroy all intruders with rain! Acid rain! But with all these impressive Type 2 civilization-like abilities, they are seemingly incapable of coming up with any long-term energy solutions. The Decepticons end up wasting or destroying far more energy than they ever managed to steal. They're pretty much just fighting for their next meal. You waste more energy with your mouth! Hey, remember that solar farm you almost destroyed? Well, just use your space bridge magic to maneuver Cybertron near a star, and then cover your already steely looking ball with solar panels. Job done. What? Why haven't you told me this before? But then there are more immediate tactical concerns that Megatron struggles with. Megatron seems to have an inbuilt obsession with vengeance, and thus he will knowingly make irrational decisions compelled into reckless actions by his nature alone. The machine appears unstable. Suggest abandoning it. Suggestion noted and ignored! <laughs> You depend on feelings and instincts to guide you, and they invariably let you down. Including, but not limited to, intentionally blowing up the facility he is currently inside. <laughs> he usually begins each fight with a vicious bout of verbal sparring. You must have a blowout in your logic circuits! There's no way a midget like you can handle the mighty Megatron! <laughs> That's right, both sides will give up any tactical advantage for the sake of getting off a few sick burns. Give up, Megatron. You've lost. On the contrary, I've just begun to triumph. Wrong again, you dipstick tape deck. You're too slow, Rusty Pants. The Autobots have the excuse that they're a bunch of wimps who don't actually want to kill anybody. But the Decepticons are meant to be hell-bent on the destruction of the Autobots. Now, now 
is the time to unleash our fury upon them and crush them! Even worse, Megatron ends each skirmish by either prematurely declaring victory. The Decepticons have won! <laughs> or prematurely calling a full retreat after getting a blood nose. Decepticons, retreat! Now, quick at once! It's nice that he uses retreat as a strategy to begin with, but it's safe to say sometimes he ends up abandoning his schemes when a win could still be salvaged from the situation. Substantial penalty for early withdrawal. We hear him scream retreat so often it might as well be his catch cry. Retreat! But even when they get the upper hand, victory can never be assured. Because despite having a countless number of engagements with the Autobots, Megatron and all within his ranks are notoriously bad at confirming the kill. Stay behind. When you see the last Autobot seek slowly out of sight, rejoin us. Not that his supposed fusion cannon could kill anyone even if he wanted it to. The energy expenditure was not high enough to cause any damage. It may not have been a weapon. Megatron also takes exposition spewing to a whole new level. What are your plans here on Earth? My plan is to conquer this mud ball of a planet and suck it dry of energy. He doesn't just tell you every minute detail of his plan prematurely, he tells you exactly what he is about to do next. Silence, miserable flesh creature! You are to be the first of a new breed. A breed of slaves. This guy practically narrates his own life. Such is the fate of all who oppose me! It's patently obvious whenever Megatron is going to fire at you, because he'll tell you. Now you will witness the power! My fusion cannon! Megatron does somewhat live up to the Decepticon name in that he weaves so much deception that his word is basically garbage. You might as well just shoot Megatron straight in the face when he stops for a chat because he is definitely, definitely up to something. It isn't even a question. Save the humans! Even when Autobot Perceptor saves Megatron's life, Perceptor is immediately betrayed without a second thought. There were plenty of other more quiet ways to infect the Autobots with rust. But Megatron then ramps up the Psycho when he takes pleasure slowly infecting the Autobots, as opposed to finishing them off quickly while he has the fleeting chance and finally ending this ancient pointless war. I don't want to melt him, Rumble. I want to let them suffer slowly. Megatron's way to inspire loyalty in his own troops is to implant a bomb in their head. It's no surprise then that he deals with Autobots who are sympathetic to the Decepticon cause even more harshly. At the very least, Megatron could have maybe convinced that one dumbass aerial bot to join the Decepticons, if not more of them. But instead, he takes advantage of their curiosity by betraying them from the outset. <laughs> Incredible, they're so naive. Helping to entrench the Decepticon hating stance for all time. That Megatron, I'll pay him back for this if it's the last thing I do. Before that, at least two of the aerial bots thought the Decepticons were pretty sweet as dudes. So Megatron carries on doing the same old stuff for two seasons. That is, until the Transformers the movie. When surprisingly, Megatron seems to be ruling over a fairly well-maintained empire centered around Cybertron. Though it's said they were ruling by fear, and we know what they're like with energy, so more more than likely, this empire would destroy itself in the not so distant future. But most impressively, Megatron finally scores a true hit on his enemies, when he brutally murders some of our favorite Autobots like it was nothing, and he even manages to kill Optimus Prime. <laughs> Which leads to Starscream's final betrayal and Megatron's eventual introduction to Unicron, who transforms him into Galvatron and cobbles together some other Decepticons from Space Junk. This is useless! At first, Galvatron seems like a massive improvement over Megatron. Not only is he now capable of transforming into a legitimately powerful cannon that he can fire all by himself. He also immediately kills Starscream the next time he sees him. This is the most progress the Decepticons have made in over 4 million years. Then, early in Season 3, Galvatron gets busy killing a ton of those filthy flesh creatures. This guy can definitely rack up a death toll. But unfortunately, not long after, we realize we've just got a Megatron 2.0. Of course I am! 
am, idiot! And that every previous strategic failing of Megatron still applies to Galvatron. Only now he rules exclusively through fear and is essentially de-evolved into an unhinged maniac. Well, all I can say is... The peak liability of the Decepticon race and ultimate loose cannon, Galvatron seems driven by not much more than his desire to inflict harm on others. Crush the Autobots to scrap! Crush the Earth and its puny humanity! Crush anyone, anything that dares to oppose us! Perhaps you should occupy your mind with pleasant thoughts before you hyperventilate. This guy will assault you for swearing allegiance to him. The sweeps and I shall serve as your elite guard. <laughs> elite guards, <laughs> you! <laughs> you better not do anything as stupid as speak out of turn. But you said no mercy, Galvatron. Very true, so I will show none. <laughs> Even just doing your job might now be misinterpreted by Galvatron as stealing his thunder. I'll help you, mighty Galvatron! I don't need your help! He'll just punch you in the face whenever he feels like it, really. Cyclonus offers to pursue some supposed traitors, and Galvatron rewards him by threatening him if he fails. Galvatron, the sweeps and I should be the ones to go. As you wish, Cyclonus, but do not fail me. I will send the Predacons after you! Or the time Galvatron threw a couple of sweeps into these energy zombies to stop them from getting him, saving himself maybe a couple of seconds at most. But Galvatron still wasn't so hectic to not stop and release his usual stream of pointless diatribe before being caught by this worm. But even if it gets me as well, I'll die with the satisfaction that the universe will have two more Autobots to mine! This is a guy who abandoned his helpless army so he could take a lengthy bath. Disturbs my plasma bath. Galvatron then leaves one of the sweeps to die after he was wounded. Galvatron, save me! Please meet your end with dignity. I despise whiners. At this point, he should be pretty concerned with Decepticon troop numbers. As soon as he catches up with the main Decepticon forces, he fires on them indiscriminately because they thought he was dead and got a ride off their crap planet with some aliens, and now they're attacking Autobots. Perish the thought. I'm already sorry! Galvatron pushes loyal troops against him due to his erratic, violent outbursts. No Decepticon ever fought more valiantly. Or less rationally. Yeah, well, maybe the Autobots should have destroyed him. They'd be doing us a favor. He'll be the death of all of us if something isn't done about him. I, for one, am tired of being passed around by our supposed leader. The respect they once had for him is severely eroded. Poor old Soundwave hardly ever talks anymore. He's a broken robot. And something else. Galvatron is so crazed, Cyclonus eventually takes him to an alien care facility, where he gets diagnosed with the equivalent of a Cybertronian mental illness. Entity exhibits a severe failure in reality processing, and a malignant plasma neural tick. Has anyone ever suggested targeted neurosynaptic therapy? Some say Galvatron suffered brain damage after a beatdown from Rodimus. Some say he developed a mental illness because of his plasma bath addiction. Whatever the cause, Galvatron is in no state to be running anything. Kill, smash, destroy! Uh, yes, go on. Rend, mangle, destroy! Though the mental health treatment goes somewhat awry, it's sort of implied that Galvatron receives some benefit from it. Ultra madness, yes, yes. Though this is a matter of debate, he does seem a bit calmer, but he's still acting irrationally and sassing Decepticons for speaking violations. Only now he's slower and screaming slightly less. Somebody's going to have to reprogram this hysterical piece of machinery! Galvatron's erraticness causes a great number of strategic errors. He just doesn't seem capable of developing anything close to a good plan. Strategies for cowards! So at one point he gets so desperate he resorts to trying to bluff the Autobots into thinking he is a super weapon. I still have my ultimate weapon, Rodimus. Surrender now, or I'll unleash its force upon you all. If such a weapon existed, he'd have used it a long time ago. He must have assumed they're as dumb as him. Ah! 
the fact that Galvatron is consistently tricked by those idiotic Quintessons should tell you something about his intellect. <laughs> Digital watch is smarter than that! Galvatron seems to have had his suspicions about the Quintessons and the supposed Decepticon Matrix of Leadership. Destroy us and you will never have the Decepticon Matrix. 77.9% probability doubts the existence of the Matrix. Right! But when Blitzwing provides intel which should confirm Galvatron's doubts, he seems to blame Blitzwing for delivering the bad news instead. Uh, uh, mighty Galvatron, there is no Decepticon Matrix. Tell it to the Autobots! <laughs> if I must. He then leaves this loyal Decepticon unit at the mercy of the Autobots. Galvatron seems to actively resist pursuing the truth. I believe in me! Making decisions based on incomplete information and constantly jumping to conclusions about the loyalties of his units. Forcing Blitzwing to betray Megatron by enlisting the Autobots to help stop the Quintesson threat. Listen, we are all of us in grave peril. A commando team of Sharktacons is about to unleash a force that will destroy us all! Galvatron then triggers the Quintesson's device, seemingly now believing the Decepticon Matrix exists, despite loads of evidence to the contrary. Perhaps you hope to find the Matrix for yourself! Don't! <laughs> Silence! Traitor! For the longest time, the Decepticons were all about fully conquering and or restoring Cybertron. Later on, after the Autobots have fully gained control of it, Maniac Galvatron then decides they'll just blow up Cybertron altogether. Just think Galvatron, when Cybertron is destroyed by this cannon, you'll be more famous in history than Unicron. What are you gonna fight over then, oil? More than you will ever as Megatron is the robot responsible for this latest Decepticon uprising, the Decepticons rely on him and Galvatron to carry on the bitter campaign of war. Without their leadership, the modern Decepticons would essentially cease to exist as a unified threat. There is no one else within the Decepticons who has the initiative, confidence or respect to lead this ornery bunch. The times we see them having a leadership crisis, they will often just start fighting each other immediately. With Galvatron presumed dead and Starscream long gone, the remaining Decepticons seem to give up completely and resign themselves to a pathetic existence on Char fighting over Energon. We can be pretty thankful that the Decepticons aren't capable or committed enough to defeat the Autobots, because their poor planet management skills, leadership problems, chaotic infighting and lack of an outlet for their destructive tendencies would no doubt spell the final end of the Transformers society. But the Decepticons aren't the only ones who don't seem capable of securing the ultimate victory. Now let's look at the other side of the equation. Finally we get to the good part. No! Me say fast forward to good part. 